Hello, I'm Shelley Quinn, and we are so glad that you're joining us for Sabbath School Panel. This quarter, we are studying themes in the Gospel of John. Today is Lesson 7 already, and our lesson is titled, Blessed Are Those Who Believe. Now, let me introduce you to my dear brothers in Christ who are sitting at the table. We have our singer in Israel, Ryan Day. <laughs> well, it's a blessing to always be on 3ABN Sabbath School panel. I have Monday's lesson entitled, The Witness of Mary. And that's going to be a good one. And then we have Professor Daniel T Perry. Thank you. I've got Tuesday's lesson, which is an intriguing title, The Unwitting Witness of Pilate. Yeah, uh, that is an intriguing title. And then Pastor John Dinsey. I have Thursday, not Wednesday's lesson, uh, The Witness of Thomas. And finally, my dear, dear friend, Pastor James Rafferty. I have Thursday's lesson, which is entitled Our Witness of Jesus. And we're all dear friends. What I'd like to do is have Daniel say a prayer for us, please. You. Dear Father in heaven, we commit ourselves again to be led by your word, to be filled by your word, and we know that word is not just ink on a page, but the word made flesh, Jesus Christ. Guide us through your Holy Spirit as we study today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you. Our memory text for today is John 20, verse 29, where Jesus said to Thomas, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. You know, throughout the Gospel of John, what we see is John presents people of various backgrounds. They come from different belief systems, experiences, and they're all testifying to who they see Jesus being. So this week, we're going to look at a few more of those testimonies. And Sunday's lesson harkens all the way back to Abraham. So we see that Jesus openly professed who he was. He wasn't shy about calling on witnesses to testify who he was. And even though some of these witnesses were long gone, Jesus made a comment to some Jews who were accusing him of being demon-possessed. He said in John 8, 56, Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. He saw it and was glad. And what did the Jews do? They say, hey, you're not even 50 years old yet. How could you have seen Abraham? And Jesus then says, Before Abraham was, I am. This was a claim to his divinity, the I am God from the burning bush we find in Exodus. Now, our lesson title is Harking Back to Abraham. Let's set up the history of Abraham. He came from a pagan nation. There was idol worship in his home. Yet Abraham was a true believer of God. He had a heart that was loyal to God. He walked in, in immediate obedience to God. He was loyal, and God knew he could trust Abraham. Abraham was a friend. Now, Abraham was a Hebrew, but he was not a Jew. Please catch that. He was a Hebrew, but not a Jew, because a Jewish nation did not exist as a distinct ethnic group at the time of Abraham. In fact, it was Abraham's grandson, Judah, his tribe, is where the term Jewish comes from. So Abraham is considered the father of all the Jews, but did you know that Romans 4.11, Paul says that Abraham is the father of all. It would be correct for us to talk about Father Abraham. Mm. We don't know when he was called out of Ur, we don't know how old he was. We know that he made a pause in Haran, and we don't know how long he was there, but he was 75 years when God called him from Haran. In Genesis 12, 3, God promised Abraham when he called him, and you all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. So it shows that God's salvation plan spans all ethnic groups, all geographic boundaries. I love Genesis 15. It's probably one of my favorite chapters in Genesis. 
Because in Genesis 15, God shows up and he tells Abraham, I am your shield, Abraham, and your exceedingly great reward. So now what happens in Genesis 15, God brings Abraham outside in verse 5. And he says, look now toward the heaven, count the stars if you're able to number them. And he said to him, so shall your descendants, your seed be. So what is he talking about seed? Well, this goes back to Genesis 3.15, where God is making a covenant promise and he introduces the everlasting covenant when he says to the serpent, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed, and he he will crush your head. You're going to bruise his heel. But this is what I love about Genesis 15. Verse 6 says that Abraham believed God and God accounted it to him for righteousness. Hallelujah. Paul quotes this in Romans 4, 3 as well. So in Genesis 15, what you see is God is ratifying the everlasting covenant of righteousness by faith. He just made Abraham righteous by faith. Now he's going to ratify this covenant in the form of a vision. He has Abraham prepare the sacrifices And then he puts Abraham into a deep sleep and divine symbols of God's presence pass between these sacrificial pieces, the smoking oven and the burning torch. That was the only presence to pass through. Typically, if somebody were going to cut a covenant, both parties would walk through. Mm. But God was not cutting a contract with humanity. God alone made the promises, and by his presence going through there, it showed he alone would keep the promises. So years later, this same man who God made righteous by faith, right? He's 99 years old. He shows up in Genesis 17. God appears to him again, and he says to him, to the man made righteous by faith, I am Almighty God. Walk before me and be blameless. Wow. Does that show us something about God's covenant of righteousness by faith? God still intends for us to walk in loyal obedience to him, motivated by love. And then God says that I will make my covenant between me and you and will multiply you exceedingly. Now, we kind of fast forward In Genesis 22, God comes to Abraham. Isaac is is his second born. He's now probably a little over 20 years old. But what God says to Abraham is, take now your son, your only son, Isaac. We know Ishmael was born first, but this is covenant language. He's talking about the only begotten son. And then he says, offer him. There is a burnt offering. An offering for sin. What? God abhorred child sacrifice. God did not allow human sacrifice. And you would think that Abraham would scratch his head and think, did I really hear this correctly? But you know what? Abraham so knew the voice of the Lord. He so trusted the Lord that he got up and he gets his son and he takes two servants, goes up to Mount Moriah, and he binds Isaac to the altar, and he's got that arm lifted up, ready to sacrifice him. When the angel of the Lord speaks and says, no, 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 this was just a test, Abraham. Now I see that you won't withhold your only son from me. And then God has a ram, which is a male sheep, show up in the thicket to be the sacrifice right there on Mount Moriah, where 2,000 years later, God would give his only unique covenant son for sacrifice. So why was Abraham so willing to go along? How, what great faith, huh? Hmm. Hebrews eleven seventeen through 19 shows us, this isn't nearly as horrific as you think it is, 
It says, by faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises, offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said, in Isaac, your seed shall be called. And here it explains why he did it, concluding that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from which he also received him in a figurative sense. So likely when God put Abraham into that deep sleep to ratify the covenant, the everlasting covenant of righteousness by faith, when he put him in that deep sleep, likely that is when Abraham saw Christ's day. He knew that God would give his unique only begotten son as a sacrifice. He would be crucified, but he knew he'd be resurrected. That's why Abraham rejoiced to see Christ's day. In Galatians 3, verses 6 through 9, Paul says this, just as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness, therefore know that only those who are of faith are the sons of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand. The gospel is found in the Old Testament saying, in you all the nations shall be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed with believing Abraham. Abraham had the everlasting gospel of righteousness by faith presented to him, and he entered into the everlasting covenant with God as an heir of that. Romans 4, 1 through 3 says, what shall we say about Abraham, our father, according to his flesh? If Abraham was justified by works, he had something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. So Romans 4.11 concludes, Abraham is the father of all. If we are Christ, we are Abraham's seed. Let me read this to you very quickly. It said just one question or one statement. It says, when Jesus said before Abraham was, I am, There's no question the leaders understood the implication of what he said because they took up stones to throw at him. They knew he was claiming to be equal with God. They knew he was saying he was Yahweh, the I am God of the Old Testament. Hmm. All right. Thank you so much, Shelley. Great start. And my name is Ryan Day. I have Monday's lesson entitled The Witness of Mary. And the lesson brings out right off the bat, it says, six days before Passover, Jesus came to visit Mary, Martha, and their brother Lazarus, whom Jesus had raised to life. Simon, who had been healed of leprosy, hosted a feast in appreciation for what Jesus had done for him. Martha was serving and Lazarus was sitting at the table with the guest. And we read about this in John chapter 12, verses 1 through 8. I'm going to go ahead and read that now. John chapter 12, verses 1 through 8. Here we see the powerful witness of Mary. Mary uh, is, is one of my favorite Bible characters. There's just something about this sister that uh, she just really, really, for lack of better words, she really encompasses and projects sometimes how I feel uh, in my gospel experience and understanding the redemption that Christ uh, has, has paid for me or given for me. And, uh, and it's just a powerful, powerful story overall to see how the Lord transformed this woman's life and Mary understood it. Uh, while the, some of the other disciples may have been struggling with who Christ was and really connecting with this idea of Messiahship and not coming as the, the common Jew thought, which is the Messiah would show up and be this conquering hero that would, you know, take the throne and uh, relieve them of their, uh, their worldly oppressors. Uh, Jesus came as the Messiah, obviously, to save people from their sins. Mary, I believe, understood this powerfully. And we see a glimpse of that here in these first eight verses of John chapter 12. Notice what the Bible says here. 
It says, then six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus was, who had been dead, whom he had raised from the dead. There they made him a supper and Martha served, but Lazarus was one of those who sat at the table with him. Then Mary took a pound of very costly oil of spikenard, anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the oil. I just want to pause there and kind of add to this, the, the scene that you really, really get in fullness when you go over and read uh, Luke's account in Luke chapter seven, this woman entering this, this scene where people are conversating and they're talking and they're visiting. And you could just imagine as she enters with what is noticeably a very, very expensive oil. Now, uh, I don't think that we could properly fully understand it today because back in those days, the cost of this oil, as the lesson brings out clearly, would have been probably around a year's wages for the common person who was working during those days. Could you imagine uh, buying some type of fragrant uh, oil of some kind or any type of fragrance and spending your entire year's salary on this. Uh, I, I can't imagine that. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, she takes, she walks in with what is clearly a, a very expensive alabaster flask containing oil that she's going to come as we read here and she's going to enter the presence of Christ. And you could imagine, uh, you know, people silencing and wondering what's going on. And as she begins to cry, and at this point, as Luke uh, 7 brings out, the, 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 the tears are splashing on the dirty feet of Jesus. And she begins to wash and cleanse his feet with her tears and, and then dry those, those now wet feet from the tears with her hair and then commences to take this oil and pour it out upon Jesus. You could imagine the gasps in the room. Uh, now, you really get an understanding of some of the attitude of the room when you go to continue to read on to verse four, notice what it says. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, who would betray him said, why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the money box and he used to take what was put in it. So he's a thief. And he was wondering, oh, we could have sold this and we could have had an abundance in our, in our, on our money box. And I could have had some for myself. That's why he was angry. Not because he really cared for the poor, as it says here, but I love Jesus response. Notice verse seven here, but Jesus said, let her alone, leave her alone, Judas. Mm -hmm. She has kept this for the day of my burial. Now, whether or not those, obviously those around, especially his disciples, we know did not fully understand. They didn't understand what, why he was saying for my burial. Uh, and I'm not even going, going to venture that Mary fully understood this either. But uh, obviously this is very, very important. In fact, he goes on to say in verse eight, for the poor you have with you always, but me you do not have always. Mary understood this part. And that is the fact that she, no matter what the case, no matter what the scenario, no matter what the cause, cost because Jesus had fully redeemed her from all of her sins. He had looked beyond her faults. He had pulled her out of that dark pit, the darkest part of her life and redeemed her and saved her from her sins. She fully comprehended this and there was nothing that was going to separate her from her savior. And that's why I love that, that song. I sing a song. It's usually, um, is technically written from the perspective of a woman, right? Because this is about Mary's alabaster box, but the, the famous song Alabaster Box that's usually sung by a woman, I sing it at all of my concerts or most of my concerts when I do one, but I just love the words of that chorus because it rings true. You know, I've come to pour my praise on him like oil from Mary's Alabaster Box. And it says, don't be angry if I wash his feet with my tears and I dry them with my hair. And I love this next part. It says, you weren't there the night he found me. No, you did not feel what I felt when he wrapped his love all around me. And you don't know the cost of the oil in my alabaster. 
box. I love to sing that song because that song captures not only the essence of the story that we're reading, the witness of Mary, that's what this uh, particular lesson is entitled, but it, it really encompasses and projects and clearly shows forward that like Mary, each and every one of us, myself, you all at home, everyone on this panel, we all have a, a, a redemption that no one else can possibly begin to fathom. That even though, yes, Christ has redeemed us all, he has, he has paid the price for each and every one of us, only you and God understand the cost of that oil or the cost of that redemption. And uh, I just love that. And it reminds me to always be gospel oriented when I'm preaching, no matter what I'm teaching, no matter what I'm sharing, always to be thankful for the redemption that I have in Christ, always to preach and teach and to share looking through the lens of Calvary, looking through the lens of what Christ has done for me. Isaiah 53 verse four and five. Did Mary understand this? You better, better believe she did. Isaiah 53, 4 and 5, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteem him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him and by his stripes we are healed. First Corinthians 6, 19 and 20, uh, the cost, uh, talking about the cost of redemption. Or do you not know, the Bible says, that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God and you are not your own. Verse 20, for you were bought at a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. We are bought at a price. And what was that price? Let us be reminded, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18 and 19, knowing that you were, were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold. No, 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 no. Jesus didn't show up, show up in the worldly courts and, and say, here's, here's, here's this uh, amount of money or this amount of gold or silver. No, 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 no. It goes on to say, whom you have from God, uh, excuse me, uh, I read, read the wrong like silver and gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. What was your life worth? The blood of Jesus Christ, the life of the Savior. Romans 5 verse 8, but God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Do we understand that? Do we comprehend the cost the cost of the life of the Son of God to redeem us because it was my sins and it was your sins that nailed him to a cross. When Mary showed up in that room with that oil, she poured out everything. She gave everything she had because she understood just exactly who Christ was. She had come to know him. She may not have been able to see all the way through to the cross or beyond, but she knew having spent time with him, having observed him, having come to know him, that this was her savior. And this indeed was the Messiah, the anointed one whom she would now anoint, of course, who would take away the sin of the world. Thank you so much. That was beautiful. I always love it when you break out into <laughs> song. And yeah. certainly that song was worth hearing. Please stay tuned for a mission moment and we'll be right back. Hello, I'm Greg Morricone. I'm so glad you've joined me for today's 3ABN Mission Moment. For the last couple of weeks, we've been talking about Travis, a young man who was bullied as a kid and struggled with learning. Later, his wife left him for another man and his world crumbled. However, God enabled Travis to go back to school, earn his college degree, and land a very good job. In spite of his apparent success, God was concerned with something even greater, Travis's salvation. One day he searched on YouTube for programs in Bible prophecy and Revelation studies. And guess what? He discovered 3ABN programming. Yes, he watched Revelation's Ancient Discoveries with Pastor Mark Finley, and he discovered about the Sabbath. Then the pandemic hit and he was laid off of work. So he spent many hours watching 3ABN programs. YouTube's algorithms recommended other 3ABN programs, including the 3ABN Sabbath School panel, and Pastor John Loma King, and he learned more about the Word of God. Feeling drawn to the Adventist faith, Travis attended a local Seventh-day Adventist church and found the human connections he longed for. He was baptized in 2022, and now he's thriving in his walk with God. Travis is grateful for those YouTube programs. God knew that when I started learning, I'd focus on Him, he says, and that when I was freed, I'd give Him my whole heart. 
Thank you for partnering with 3ABN in YouTube evangelism. And that's today's 3ABN Mission Moment. And now we're excited to continue beginning with Tuesday, Daniel Parent. Thank you, Shelley. I have Tuesday's lesson, which is going to feel like quite a contrast against Ryan's The Witness of Mary. I have The Unwitting Witness of Pilate. Mm. Looking at Jesus' trial before Pilate, which we find in John 18 and 19, and the lesson begins by asking, how is Pilate's verdict connected to the theme of John's gospel? And we see the theme of John's gospel again in John 20, verse 31. These things are written, that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ. And so John, the gospel writer, shows us that the evidence that leads to belief is everywhere. The book is brimming with evidence and testimony in all sorts of places that we would expect and even in places that we might not expect. God is showing us uh, evidence to believe even in the man Pontius Pilate. And the part Pontius Pilate plays in the Gospel of John is not a small part. There are 37 verses devoted to his conversation and interaction with Jesus. Now, we don't know anything about his early life, but the existence of Pilate has been confirmed through multiple historical and archaeological uh, evidences, and he was the Roman procurator of Judea from AD 26 to 36, which overlapped all of John the Baptist's ministry and all of Jesus' ministry. Uh, he hated the Jews that he ruled over, and he didn't have any problem shedding innocent blood. That was not a problem with him, which is important when we look at how he interacted with Jesus. So why is Pilate's testimony important, and why should it matter to us? Well, Pilate was not a disciple of Jesus. He was not a Jew. He was not among God's people. Uh, there were good Gentiles, and he was not even among one of those. So far as we know, Pilate never witnessed a miracle, never heard Jesus teach or preach. At the very least, Pilate is disinterested, and at the most, perhaps he's antagonistic against Jesus about some, uh, some person who's brought to him as a potential king. And that's one of the strengths about what Pilate has to say, is because his witness is completely unsolicited, and it's neutral, and it's dis disinterested, he has no stake in the matter of whether or not Jesus is the Christ or not. Mm. And so there can be no claim of collusion or conspiracy from him. And so that word unwitting, it means not intentional, unaware, or unconscious. So since, Jesus, since Pilate is not Jesus' follower, you can't say that he had any sort of bias. At the very least, he's probably irritated and would be happy if Jesus just went away. And so when Jesus is brought before Pilate by the Jews, something about Jesus indicates to Pilate that he needs to give him his attention. And so without saying a word, Jesus is obviously different in the way that he behaves from other criminals brought into his presence. And Pilate is intrigued and he calls Jesus in for a private interview out and away from the interference of the Jewish leaders who are obviously dead set against him because Pilate needs to figure things out without being told what to think. So in other words, Pilate doesn't look at Jesus with a momentary glance, and nor does he put his rubber stamp of approval on accusations others bring him, but he examines Jesus from his position as a Roman ruler. And so from that position, uh, his, his words at least have some weight of having some official, official status, official statement, even though he's not a godly man, he bears the stamp of speaking on behalf of Rome. And so the conversation that Pilate has with Jesus is recorded in John 18, verses 33 to 38. And we'll look at at least the last part of it. Because Pilate is now digging in to find if there is any political cause to put Jesus to death. And so he asks the question of Jesus, are you the king of the Jews? That's in verse 33. And Jesus answered him, are you speaking for yourself about this? Or did others tell you this concerning me? Pilate answered, am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you to me. What have you done? In other words, he says, this is meaningless to me. I'm not among your people. This is not an issue I care of. They're bringing the accusation. 
Verse 36, Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from this world. So ultimately, Jesus' response is not an earthly kingdom. Because that's what Pilate is interested in here. Are you a competitor? Are you setting up some political rival kingdom? And Jesus flat out tells him, that's not what I'm here for at all. Or you would have seen evidence of this. And then verse 37, Pilate therefore said to him, Are you a king then? Jesus answered, You say rightly that I am a king. For this cause I was born, and for this cause I have come into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my, hears my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? Here this man is adrift. Uh, he doesn't, as far as the spiritual truths of reality, he doesn't know. He's just making guesses. And when he had said this, he went out again to the Jews and said to them, I find no fault with him at all. In other words, Pilate sees no political cause in putting Jesus to death. And here's a man who would gladly have condemned Jesus quickly if he could. The Jewish leaders are wanting Pilate to see that he's a criminal. But essentially, Pilate is saying, whatever's wrong with him, it has totally to do with your religious laws and your political maneuverings. There is no, there's no political reason. It is all about the spiritual realities of who this man is, and I don't care about that. So Pilate then takes, who is in his hand, he takes the way, the truth, and the life, and he has him scourged. And he allows the soldiers to place a crown of thorns on his head and beat him again in the praetorium, and then brings out the way, the truth, and the life, Jesus, and twice more makes the same declaration. In chapter 19, verse 4, Pilate went out again and said to them, Behold, I'm bringing him out to you that you may know that I find no fault with him. Mm -hmm. Then verse 6, he went to the chief priests, or therefore when the chief priests and officers saw him, they cried out saying, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, You take him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. This is the third time Pilate has declared, from a political standpoint at least, I find no fault with him. It's all about the spiritual claims that he's making. So even through all this hard-heartedness, Pilate himself could see what's going on, and he recognized that, that Jesus himself was not guilty. And Jesus, I, I like 1 Timothy 6, 13, where he says, I urge you, Paul writes, I urge you in the sight of God, who gives life to all things, and before Christ Jesus, who witnessed the good confession before Pontius Pilate, Jesus makes the testimony. He, he testifies with a good witness before Pilate, and Pilate can see that. Chapter 19, verse 15, we finally get to Pilate's unwitting witness that ultimately pushes the Jewish leaders over the edge so that they could, so that all could see what was truly in their hearts when they say, we have no king but Caesar. It just said, you're no friend of Caesar's if you let this man go. And now the Jewish leaders say, we have no king. Our only king is Caesar. The Jewish leaders here, claiming to be motivated by their loyalty to God and their loyalty to Israel, until they are compelled by Pilate here to state their true loyalty. And ultimately, that is going to happen to all people in the world. We will be pushed to com uh, and compelled to state, on which side do you stand? So Pilate's witness here actually pushes the Jewish leaders to reveal the truth mm -hmm. about what's in their heart. Finally, then, Pilate's written testimony, written in three languages in verse 19, uh, he puts it in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. And they begged him to change it, but he would not change it. And what does this tell us? Well, a couple of things. And number one is that unwitting testimony lives on. Pilate died ignorant of the fact that this was the most important thing he ever did. Mm -hmm. That 2,000 years later, we're still talking about this half hour long experience that he participated in because words have convincing power that live on that we may never know. Our example has convincing power and we, we may not realize it, but somebody is always watching. 
And number two, we may carefully manicure our example for the times when we are engaged in specific ministry, but unguarded moments are going to tell truly what's going on in our hearts, and that's what goes on with the Jewish leaders. We need the sanctifying influence of God so that at all times we are overflowing with a witness for Christ. And number three, not everybody who testifies for Jesus is sanctified by faith in Jesus. As uh, Pilate says there in verse 5 of chapter 19, behold the man. He says the same thing that John said in different, in different words. Behold the man, look at Jesus, but his life is not dedicated to him. And so our goal, our purpose is to be sanctified, filled, so we can witness for Christ, not unwittingly, but intentionally. Amen. Very interesting. Never looked at that angle. Well, we now are on Wednesday portion of the lesson, The Witness of Thomas. My name is John Dinsey, and we read in John chapter 20. We're going to look at verses 19 through 31, The Witness of Thomas, beginning in verse 19. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut and where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. So what happens here? Apparently they weren't glad before, but now they are. Because now they get to see their Savior, their Master, their Rabbi, Jesus Christ. What great rejoicing moment that must have been, because they had heard that uh, the tomb was empty. They had heard from uh, Mary that uh, he said, hey, uh, I'm going to see you guys later, but now they get to see him, and they are glad when they see the Lord. Uh, those, those, uh, that experience must have been unforgettable. And so they say, uh, verse 21, now, so Jesus said to them again, Peace be peace to you, as the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he has said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Verse 24. Now Thomas called the twin, and I think it says in the King James Version, the Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said to him, We have seen the Lord. Now, this should have, called, this should have brought forth, uh, Praise the Lord from Thomas. Uh, wonderful. Tell me, what did he say? What did he do? When did you see him? How were his hands? How, was, how, how were his, uh, his forehead? Tell me about it. What did he say? But no. Notice what happens. So he said to them, unless I see in his hands the print of the nails and put my finger into the print of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. Mm. Wow, what a declaration. Uh, now, if this had been one person that he was talking to, perhaps you may have say, well, you know, maybe you were not well, you were sleepy or something, and you maybe you dreamed this. But we're talking about the witness of many disciples, at least 10 of them. And so he is choosing not to believe until he sees for himself and not only see, but talking about putting his hands or his fingers into the wounds of Jesus. The lesson brings this out. Thomas was dictating the condition of his faith. This approach to faith in Jesus has appeared over and over in John. Nicodemus answered Jesus with, how can a man be born when he is old? John 3, 4. The woman at the well asked, sir, you have no bucket and the well is deep. Where do you get the living water? John 4, 11. The crowd who had been fed with the loaves and fishes asked, what sign are you going to give us? So we have these different things that have happened here in the book of John, but this particular instance where Thomas is hearing from the disciples, his own friends, his own fellow believers, he is choosing to ignore their witness. He is choosing to completely 
uh, say, I am not believing. Uh, you know, and you, it, he made this declaration. What if, what if a thousand people, what if 500 or a thousand said this same thing to Thomas? No, he had laid the lines until I put my fingers there. I will not believe. This is uh, something very dangerous because the witness of Jesus, the witness of the disciples were compelling to say the least. I mean, they, they had all experienced the same thing. They had all been potentially sad, depressed, but now they are rejoicing and he decides to uh, remains in sorrow uh, uh, by not accepting the witness of his fellow believers. Mm -hmm. You know, in John chapter 20, uh, verse 15, we, we, we read this. Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? She, supposing him to be the gardener, said to, said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. Now, I read this to you so that you'll understand that this is before the experience of Thomas in the evening. And in, the, uh, in John, here in John chapter 20, verse 17, notice what he says. Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my father, but go to my brethren, to them and, and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father and to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene, notice, came and told the disciples that she has seen the Lord and that he has spoken these things to her. When you go to Matthew chapter 28, it even gives you additional information uh, concerning this. And it says in Matthew 28 and verse 10, uh, Then said Jesus unto them, Be not afraid, talking to the women, go tell my brethren, that they go into Galilee and there they shall see me. So Jesus sends a message through Mary and the other Marys. Uh, tell them I'm going to Galilee and I will see them there. So they did. So the question is, was Thomas among the disciples when this message came forth and said, hey, uh, we seen Jesus. He's alive. Mm. He is well. But he said that we're going to see him later on in Galilee. So did Thomas choose not to accept this witness as well? He is known even today as Doubting Thomas. And whenever somebody uh, has some doubt, people say, oh, you're a Doubting Thomas. Now, when we go to John chapter 20, uh, verse 26, notice the encounter that Jesus has here with the disciples and Thomas. And after eight days, his disciples were again inside. Eight days had passed. And all this time, who knows how many times people told, hey, we heard that Jesus is alive and he's, he's well, he's resurrected from the dead. The same thing was said. I will not believe until I see and I put my finger. And he repeated this a, a few times, more than likely. Uh, John 20, 26, Jesus came, the doors being shut and stood in the midst and said, peace to you. Then he said to Thomas, uh-oh, <laughs> Thomas, reach your finger here and look at my hands and reach your hand here and put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. Wow. I don't know uh, what Thomas w went through his mind at that moment. He must have been sad. His heart must have broken, but uh, let me read this to you first before I tell you his reaction. That word unbelieving is interesting because it's a Greek word that means actually unbelieving. In the King James Version, it says faithless. Do not be faithless, it says. Uh, so the, the word means unbelieving without confidence in anyone, violating one's faith, also unfaithful. False and treacherous, an unbeliever, and even an infidel is implied by this word that was used by John. Mm. John chapter 20, verse 28. And Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. Mm. Wow, what a tremendous declaration. He is actually saying, You are divine. Mm -hmm. You're my Lord. You're my God. Now he had to wait until he saw Jesus to fully accept. Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen me and yet have believed. He was not commended for his unbelief. 
he was actually rebuked. And uh, we have to take into consideration that his unbelief had an influence on other believers they had not seen Jesus. Wow, Thomas is not believing this. You know, it has an influence. When you express unbelief in the truth, you could infect others with the same type of unbelief. In the story of redemption by Ellen G. White, it says, at this time, Thomas was not present. He would not humbly receive the report of the disciples, but firmly and self-confidently affirmed that he would not believe unless he should put his fingers in the prints of the nails and his hand in the side where the cruel spear was thrust. In this, he showed a lack of confidence in his brethren. If all should require the same evidence, none would now receive Jesus and believe in his resurrection. But it was the will of God that the report of the disciples should be received by those who could not themselves see and hear the risen Savior. Wow. Just picking up there, my name is James Rafferty, and I've got Thursday's lesson, Our Witness of Jesus. Just picking up there where uh, Pastor John Dinsey left off, it's really significant, I think, that statement that if we were to act the part of Thomas, there would be no believers today because none of us were there with Jesus at that time. And Thomas was able to do that, but the whole point was there's going to be a lot of people, us in particular, uh, that aren't going to be able to put our hands and fingers and touch and see. That We have to go by the testimony of believers, mm -hmm. our witness. So over and over again, the quarterly says, as John presents witnesses to Jesus, his point is to bring us to a sweeping conclusion. And the conclusion is found here in John chapter 20 and verses 30 and 31. And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. So when you think about this, you, you can imagine being there in person right? Being there in person and seeing Jesus Christ in the flesh. And as you see him in the flesh, you see these miracles that are taking place. You have all the evidence that you need. And of course, hopefully we'd certainly believe, mm -hmm. right? Seeing all that and being there. Um, but is it possible that today we have even more evidence for believing in Jesus Christ than those who actually saw his miracles. And if we do, how is that so? What are some of the things, the quarterly asks, that we have today that those living in the time of Jesus didn't have that would help us to believe? I wanna look at two verses before we look at these other Bible verses. I wanna look at two verses in the book of John, the Gospel of John. The first verse is found in John chapter 13 and verse 19. John chapter 13 and verse 19. And for those of us who are prophecy gurus, we're going to know exactly what this verse is going to say. I'm thinking of Ryan over there, 13, 19, and John 14, 29. John 13, 19, now I tell you before it is come that when it is come to pass, you might believe that I am he. And of course, John 14, 29 basically says the same thing. And now I've told you before it come to pass that when it is come to pass, you might believe. Now, if you haven't quite caught on yet, what John is teaching us in John 13, 19, and in John 14, verse 29, is Bible prophecy. Mm -hmm. Because to tell us ahead of time those things that are going to come to pass is Bible prophecy. It's the definition of Bible prophecy. I've told you ahead of time, so when it comes to pass, you might believe. Bible prophecy is what we have. And think about this, because it's really significant. The disciples were told about the destruction of Jerusalem, but they never saw it. John might have been alive, well, he definitely was alive after 70 AD, so John definitely would have seen it, but most of the disciples probably died, even Paul probably died before the destruction of Jerusalem took place. We are on the other side of that. Jesus predicted an event that the disciples could hardly believe. They were beside themselves when Jesus said it. In fact, Jesus had to kind of mingle the destruction of Jerusalem with the signs of the end of the world because the disciples would have been overwhelmed by it. Now we've seen it actually take place. And that's not even a drop in the bucket. That doesn't even begin to describe 
the Bible prophecies that God has revealed to us. In, in John chapter 13, verse 19, Jesus is speaking specifically about Judas. He's telling the disciples about Judas, that Judas is going to betray him. And he's saying, I'm telling you this, this ahead of time so that when it happens, you might believe. See, Bible prophecy is a key part of belief in Jesus Christ. That's why the devil tries to do everything he can to stop us from searching Bible prophecy, from understanding Bible prophecy, from discovering the truth that God has revealed in Bible prophecy, and especially from studying the book of Revelation. Oh, he doesn't want us to get into the book of Revelation. And God knew this. That's why God put a triple blessing on the book of Revelation. A lot of Christians, they're afraid of the book of Revelation, right? Because it's been misrepresented. This book is the revelation of Jesus, but we've made it all about the revelation of the Antichrist and the revelation of all these doomsday prophecies, but it's not. It's the, it's the revelation of Jesus Christ. And that revelation actually builds faith. It builds confidence because when you look through the prophecies that Christ predicted that God gave to us, prophecies that are now past or happening or just ahead of us, your faith is developed. It's strengthened. It's matured. You increase your faith when you see these Bible prophecies being fulfilled. And the disciples didn't see this. The disciples could only look forward to, I mean, the, the one prophecy that they were able to understand eventually was the prophecies that dealt with Christ being crucified. They didn't understand it when Christ said it. They didn't know or understand what Jesus was saying about Judas betraying him. But God has given us this same truth in relationship to another son of perdition, because that's what Judas was called, the son of perdition. In 2 Thessalonians, for example, the quarterly brings this out, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and also Matthew 24, 2, and Matthew 24, 14, the preaching of the gospel to all the world, and Matthew 24, 6 through 8, all of those signs of wars and rumors of wars and earthquakes and pestilence and famines in different places increasing in intensity and frequency like birth pains until finally the gospel is preached to all the world and Jesus returns. When we look at these signs being fulfilled, it is supposed to develop or strengthen faith. It's, it strengthens or develops belief in Jesus Christ. We have something the disciples never had. And sometimes when you go back to the disciples, people will say, well, you know, back in the days of the disciples, oh, they did all kinds of miracles. They cast out devils, you know, and, and they were able to do all kinds of wonders. How come we don't see that today? Well, they didn't have something that we have today and therefore, they needed something to buoy their faith. And the thing that buoyed their faith and their belief was, of course, these miracles, these signs. Jesus said, these signs are going to follow you. The Great Commission was given. These signs are going to follow you. And they're going to help you and help others to believe in you and in me and in the message that, that is being proclaimed. And then as we move down the passage of time, we see prophecy after prophecy being fulfilled. We see the prophecy about the Dark Ages and the church going into the wilderness, coming out of the wilderness. We see the prophecy of the remnant church. We see a recovery of the truth about the heavenly sanctuary, the mediation of Jesus Christ, the commandment keepers who also have the faith of Jesus. We see the falling away that was predicted, and we see how this whole system was corrupted, this whole uh, uh, True, beautiful gospel, everlasting gospel truth was corrupted by the darkness of apostasy and the falling away. And now it's being recovered and God is bringing us back into this light. All of this. And so why are we thirsting for these signs of miracles and casting out devils, et cetera, et cetera, when we have this vast uh, treasure house of prophetic fulfillment to bolster and buoy our faith and our belief in Jesus Christ. And, and God has not only given us prophecies that have, had, have been fulfilled, but he's actually given us prophecies that are yet to be fulfilled, mm -hmm. which in a, in a sense is incredible when you think about it, because even as we look at these prophecies, even, even as we uh, define them and pronounce them and declare them to the world, for example, we talk about the mark of the beast and a time coming when no man's going to buy or sell. Everyone is going to be constrained to receive a, a mark or they're not going to be able to buy or sell. And for years, we've, we've talked about this and applied this and people said, no, 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 that, that can't happen, especially not in the United States. This is a free country. There's never going to be a time when you're going to be denied access to, you know, to, to school or to grocery stores or to, to entertainment or to medical institutions or, you know, there's never going to be a time when that's going to happen. And then in the last three years, all of a sudden, people are being denied access not for the reason that's laid out in Revelation 13, because definitely that reason is worship, but at least to wake us up to the reality that that can happen. It can happen. We have powers that can control the economics of the world 
overnight. And you and I are going to be affected by that. This should really give us belief in Jesus Christ, who is the word. Now, remember, we don't want to separate Jesus from his word. It's his word that is coming to us. And all of these prophecies, in a sense, are kind of stepping into this casting out devils and these miracles that the disciples did, and even the very presence of Jesus in the flesh. All of these prophecies are stepping into that. This revelation of Jesus Christ is stepping into that, and it's encouraging us to have faith and belief in Jesus Christ as our Savior. Again, let me just share this la- this one verse with you in Revelation, or excuse me, in John chapter thirteen, verse nineteen. And now Jesus says, "I tell you, before it come, that when it is come to pass, ye may believe that I am He." And really, that's what prophecy is about. Prophecy not about believing in the prophecy. We have no choice when the prophecy takes place. We have to believe in it. There it is. But prophecy is about the prophecy coming to pass so that we would believe in the person that gave us the prophecy. And that person is Jesus Christ. There's nobody else but God himself who can predict the end from the beginning, who can show us the future. He is God and there's none like him. Let's believe in Mm -hmm. him. What a beautiful time in the scripture and the gospel of John. Thank you, James and Johnny and Daniel and Ryan. We have just a couple of minutes left, and we want to give each person just an opportunity for a closing thought. Absolutely. You know, um, based on Monday's lesson, the witness of Mary, we see there that she understood the redemptive power of her Savior, Jesus Christ. And uh, what came to mind in the closing moments here in my mind was Ephesians 1, 7. It says, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. Now, Pilate said true things about Jesus, but he did not know the truth that sets us free. And as a result of that, he violated his conviction that Jesus was blameless. He had him executed all the while saying that he himself was without blame. Hmm. I read to you from the Desire of Ages, page 807. Many who, like Thomas, wait for all cause of doubt to be removed will never realize their desire. They gradually become confirmed in unbelief. Those who educate themselves to look on the dark side and murmur and complain know not what they do. They are sowing the seeds of doubt and they will have a harvest of doubt to reap. At a time when faith and confidence are most essential, many will find thus find themselves powerless to hope and believe. Your mind gets educated in doubt and you will not have the ability to accept the truth. You know, many of Christ's disciples had him in the person. Even Thomas, doubting Thomas, was able to touch the person of Christ. We can't do that today. But God has given us prophecies, Bible prophecies that they never had, that have been fulfilled and are being fulfilled and are yet to be fulfilled to buoy and strengthen our belief in Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, each and every one. And just remember, blessed are those who believe. And we hope that this has bolstered your belief in the second person of the Godhead who came down, took on the flesh and took on flesh and blood to become the person of Jesus Christ. Please join us next week for lesson eight. That is fulfilling Old Testament prophecies. Our prayer for you is that the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the love of the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit is with you always.